Welcome to the church at Station Hill. If you would stand with us, let's begin worshiping together. Let's sing. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. not how we did that when I was growing up, just so you know, but that's okay. Welcome to Station Hill this morning. We're so glad you are here, and uh, we're especially glad if you're a first-time visitor with us or if you've only visited a few times. If you haven't filled out the communications card that is on the back of the bulletin that you should have received uh, when you came in, if you would fill that out, tear it off, put in the offering plate a little bit later in the service, that way we can get in touch with you and get to know you a little bit better. As we continue in worship this morning, if you would just turn around, shake a couple hands, and then we will continue worshiping together. be a little new to you, but follow along, you'll catch along. I have a hope. I have a hope. I have a future. I have a destiny that is yet awaiting me. My life's not over. A new beginning's just begun. I have a
Psalm 146, 10 says, The Lord reigns forever, your God, O Zion. For all generations, praise the Lord. Let's continue praising the Lord together. seated. Well, as you know, at Station Hill, uh, each month we pick a different unreached people group to pray for uh, for the month. And for the month of June, we'll be praying for the Khmer people of Cambodia. Uh, there's about 14 and a half million Khmer people in Cambodia. And of that 14 and a half million, 90% of them are Buddhist, with less than 2% being evangelical Christians. And I know that Cambodia is a long way from Spring Hill, Tennessee, but God continues to bring the nations to the Middle Tennessee area. And a recent report uh, showed that about 2,000 Khmer people live right here in the Middle Tennessee area. So we have an excellent opportunity uh, as a church uh, and as believers to reach the nations just right here where we live. Um, we have some prayer cards for the Khmer people in the atrium. You're welcome to take one of these. These are a great uh, way to remember to pray for them this month. Um, they're great to stick in your Bible or uh, in your car, on the fridge. Just a great way to remember to pray for these people uh, during the month of June. Also, when you came in this morning, you should have received a bulletin. Inside is a prayer guide for Vacation Bible School. If you haven't noticed, there's lots of things hanging in this room that usually aren't. 
Uh, we're not yet done yet hanging everything. Uh, it'll look much different tomorrow, but our team has been working very, very hard uh, for about six months or so, getting ready for the week that begins tomorrow. And so please pray for us in that uh, prayer guide. Uh, We listed 10 specific ways to pray for us this week. Even though we have an amazing team that's been working so hard for months and months, we cannot be successful this week without prayer. So we're counting on your prayers. Please pray for us. Uh, We're super excited. Right now we're on track for the biggest vacation Bible school that we've ever had. And with that comes the greatest opportunity for the gospel that we've ever had. So we're super excited. Please uh, partner with us through prayer. We're uh, really excited to see what God's going to do this week at Vacation Bible School. Uh, So as we begin our time uh, for prayer and altar time in just a moment, uh, I want to invite you just to join us in prayer. Like we talked about last week, that prayer is a gift that God invites us into the work that he's doing in our lives and in the world around us. And so we're going to take a few minutes uh, and pray together. Brian Coates will be preaching this morning, and he'll be down here at the front. So I know he would appreciate your prayers. You're welcome to come to the front and pray uh, yourself. Come pray over Brian, or you can stay right where you're at and pray. So let's take a few minutes and go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we love you. We thank you for the goodness and the grace that you show us every day. Father, we pray now for the Khmer people of Cambodia, the Khmer people who are here in Middle Tennessee. Father, we pray that you would show us how we can engage them with the gospel, not just across the world, but right here in Middle Tennessee. Father, our prayer is that one day the Khmer people of Cambodia will be able to say, I am a child of God. Yes, I am. So Father, advance the gospel. Let them hear it. Let them know it. Let them believe it. And Father, equip us in every way that we can so that we can reach them. Father, we pray for Vacation Bible School that begins tomorrow. It's very fitting. It's called In the Wild because it's going to be wild around here tomorrow in less than 24 hours. But we are so excited for the work that you're going to do in and through this church. And we thank you for the opportunity that we have to be involved in equipping the next generation with the gospel. And Father, we ask for the children who don't know you, God, as they hear the gospel this week for three hours a day, for five straight days, God, that it would plant deeply in their hearts and their minds and their lives. We pray for the volunteers, for the children, for the families that will bring the children, for the staff, for everybody who's involved, God. We pray your blessing over our week. And Father, we also pray for Brian now as he comes in just a few minutes to give us a message from your word. Father, help us to be changed by your word and help us to live it in our lives every day. Father, we love you. We thank you for the gift of your son. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. Hey, you remember that uh, Bible verse from Proverbs, trust in the Lord with all your heart. You know what I'm talking about? Lean not on your own understanding. You remember the rest? In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Very good. You didn't know there was going to be a quiz this morning, did you? I think that might have been one of the first Bible verses I ever ever learned, maybe at vacation Bible school. I don't know. But this week and last week, God has been bringing that to my mind over and over again as I've talked to people who are going through things. In fact, I had I had a friend of mine actually say to me, in all sincerity, Brandon, how in the world am I supposed to trust God in this? What does that look like? And so I was able to share with him what I will share with you now, that this moment 
where we give our tithes and our offerings, God has been using in my own life lately to show me this, that what we give is not about God testing whether we trust him or not. It's about God teaching us how to trust him. So this morning, as you give, I pray that he would also work in your life, that he would bring you closer to him by learning to trust him as we acknowledge him in all our ways. As our ushers come forward this morning, bow with me if you would, and let's pray that the Lord would bless this offering. Lord, I know this week there's going to be a lot of things happening here with Vacation Bible School, and it's going to take a lot of giving. A lot of people are giving of their time, their talent, and their treasure, and their testimony. Lord, I pray that you would reveal to us, though, in the midst of it all, that as much as you use our tithes and offerings to do your work on the outside, that the greater miracle is what you're doing in us on the inside. Thank you for that, for letting us trust you. In Christ's name we pray it. Amen. Good morning, Station Hill Church family. I'm Jay Strother, your campus and teaching pastor. And today is week two of three in our series, Outflow, talking about our spiritual habits and practices. Last week, we looked at prayer. This week, we look at the study of scripture from 2 Timothy chapter three. Bringing you today's message is our very own Brian Coates. Brian has a heart of a leader, but he also has a heart for God's word. And so in just a few moments, he's going to come and bring you that word. Today, I'm preaching at the church in Nolensville. Just a few weeks ago, this campus moved into a temporary facility there in the community of Nolensville, and they're already reaching new lives and new families. So pray for me as I preach there. I look forward to being back with you next week. But right now, pray and welcome our very own Brian Coates as he comes to bring us God's word. Good morning. It's good to be with you guys today. I can confirm that Jay made it back alive from vacation. Uh, he was not eaten by a bear and his kids didn't leave him out west, so he did make it to Nolensville this morning and I'm thankful for the opportunity to get to be with you this second week of our sermon series called Outflow. Uh, as we talked about last week, uh, with Taylor, he led us to, to look back at how we need to rely on God through prayer, how God has given that to us as a gift. And this week, we're looking at the discipline of reading God's Word. And I became convicted as I was studying this week that in order to be disciplined in reading God's Word, we have to first trust it and believe that it has authority over our lives. So well, that's what we will be looking at today. And also, as I was preparing... Uh, to go into this message and thinking back on past experiences, I was reminded of a time before Christine and I got married when we taught a three-year-old Sunday school class together. So we were in seminary, I was in seminary, and we went to the same church, and we were dating at that point in time, that's a key word there, so we were dating, and so I thought, hey, I'll help her out in teaching this three-year-old Sunday school class. I wish I could tell you it was out of this pure motive to disciple the lives of these young toddlers and point them to the word, but we were dating. So this was an extended interview. This was a way for me to show my gentle, caring side for these young children. Yeah, you know, I mean, me with toddlers. Yeah, so I went along with her. It was me and her and her roommate, and every week what ended up happening is I was the disciplinarian. I was the one that all the little fidgety kids went to, but they directed the rest. So we would do the craft, and then we would do a couple of different games, and then we would always move to this rug. You know what I'm talking about in a preschool classroom, the mat or the rug where you try to gather all of the children together for the Bible story time. So we would go to the rug, and before they'd get into the Bible story, they would start to sing some of the familiar songs that we teach preschoolers in church. If you've grown up in church, you remember some of them. You remember the B-I-B-L-E? Yes, that's the book for me. Yeah, I'm not going to sing it to you. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L. You remember that one? Another one we'd sing every week that the kids loved that I didn't really know before we taught this class was read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. All right, some of you know it. And we would sing that like 10 times, really repetitive. And then we'd get to the second part of the song where we'd go, don't read your Bible, don't pray every day, and you'll what? Shrink, shrink, shrink. 
And we'd repeat that a lot. And it was always funny to watch these literal concrete three-year-old thinkers as they're singing that song, realizing like, wait a minute, I don't know how to read, so I can't read my Bible. Does that mean that I'm going to start to literally shrink? <laughs> we had a lot of fun doing that, but I remember those songs because when we would teach them those songs, we were trying to instill in them a very foundational truth, teaching them about a God that they could trust, a Savior that came, the person of Jesus Christ, and then an authoritative word that they could build their lives upon in the Bible. We know that from our childlike obedience that we can go back to God's word, but for some reason as we grow up and as we get older, we think that we get wiser, that we have more knowledge, or that maybe our feelings or maybe our rationale or our reasoning or whatever we encounter, these new ideas can somehow take the place of that childlike obedience that we once had. So as we begin this sermon, as we look back at 2 Timothy 3, my hope and my prayer for all of us today is that we will be reminded that we can hold on to the truth. We can continue on in what we have learned and firmly believed because we have been given a message. We have been given a word from God. Therefore, it is true and we can trust it. So if you will stand with me in honor of God's word as we look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 through 17. 2 Timothy 3, 10 through 17. This is Paul writing to Timothy. He says, But you have followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, and endurance, along with the persecutions and sufferings that came to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and yet the Lord rescued me from them all. In fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Evil people and imposters will become worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. You know those who taught you, and you know that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you, to remind ourselves and correct our thoughts about your character and your goodness and your love for us and the truth of the gospel that has set us free. Lord, we thank you that you have given us your word. Lord, we thank you that it is trustworthy, that it is authoritative, and that it is sufficient to show us the way to salvation. God, restore our confidence and our childlike faith in what you have provided to us through your grace. We love you and we thank you for Christ. It's in his name we pray, amen. You may be seated. So jumping into the middle of 2 Timothy, just some things to know and be reminded of from this book. This was Paul's last letter. He wrote this before he was executed by the Romans. And so he is trying to get this last final message to his protege, to his mentee, Timothy, who is pastoring or being the lead elder of the church at Ephesus. So imagine if you were writing your last letter to the person that you had been training. You would want to get everything included. You would want to make sure that all of the important facts and details were included so that you would encourage this person to, to continue on in what they had learned. So Paul here throughout the entire letter is talking urgently. He, you sense the urgency to be bold in the gospel to hold on to what Timothy had learned with the doctrine, with the teaching from Paul himself, the truth of the gospel, hold on to it, be bold in your proclamation because Ephesus was a rough place. So the thought, the, the train of thought that Paul offers us here in this section is he gives us two ways that he wants Timothy to look back at his example and to look to the word so that he would hold on to the truth so that he would continue on in the faith. So the first part of our passage that we'll look at is in verses 10 through 13, where Paul tells Timothy, but you, Timothy, remember my example or follow my example. Look back at the text with me. Paul writes, but you have followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, and endurance, 
along with the persecutions and sufferings. And then he lists some of the towns that he had been on in his missionary journeys. These towns are important because when Paul lists this, he's taking Timothy back to the beginning of his ministry. He's telling Timothy, you have seen my entire missionary work. You have seen what I have done. You have heard how I've taught. You've observed my character. And you've watched how I have endured all types of persecutions. Follow my example. Remember what I have done. Remember how I have lived. He camps out there on the persecutions at the end of verse 11. He says, what persecutions I endured, and yet the Lord rescued me from them all. So Timothy, follow my example. You've seen how I've lived. Also remember my example in trusting in the God who rescued me and would continue to rescue me. Paul's telling Timothy, follow me in this. Trust in the Lord who is with me at all times, even during the worst persecutions. And verse 12 gives us a verse that none of us are really comfortable reading. When Paul writes, he says, and in fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Timothy in Ephesus would be persecuted. Church history tells us that he was martyred for the faith, that he was killed for his faith in Christ and proclaiming the truth of the gospel. And for us, that idea of persecution thankfully seems foreign. We are not threatened for our faith. Nobody's busting up the worship service today. But that's the reality for millions of believers throughout the world. Just this week, our partners in Nepal had their pastor training center ransacked and things were stolen from them because they were believers. They are facing persecution. And we may not be facing it right now in that way, but you'll encounter ridicule. You'll lose friends. You may lose your job. People won't like your antiquated beliefs. They'll walk away from you and think that you're old fashioned if you cling to this book. Paul is telling Timothy, you're going to face persecutions in church. We may not have it as rough as Timothy did, but we will face ridicule for the sake of the gospel, and maybe someday we will face true persecution the way Timothy did. So he's saying, follow my example and be prepared for what will happen. And then on another encouraging note, Paul says, evil people and imposters will become worse, deceiving and being deceived. Like, thanks, Paul. This is really an uplifting message for Timothy. But he wants him to be prepared and to remember his example Because as he is leading the church at Ephesus, he will face persecution and there will be false teachers. These evil people, these imposters that were twisting the gospel, that were trying to lead the Ephesian people away from the truth that they had heard from Paul himself. This was going to continue to happen. It would continue to get worse. Things aren't going to get better in terms of what the world is trying to do to attack the gospel. We have to be ready for that. But Paul says, look back at how I have lived. Look at how I have taught. And remember that I endured because God rescued me. So you, Timothy, but you, don't follow after what is new. Follow my example. And this is a bridge in the passage to move into verses 14 through 17, where Paul again compares these evil imposters to the example that he wants Timothy to follow. When he says in verse 14, but as for you, Continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. Paul tells Timothy here, don't go after what is new or what is novel. The false teachers proclaiming a new philosophy or a new twist or a new angle on the gospel that may seem to appeal to your intellect or a feeling. Don't go after the new thing. Hold on to what you already have. Hold on to the truth that's been given to you. What a message for us. We live in a world where new things are thrown in front of us at all times. We've got to get the new iPhone. We've got to get the new car model, new house, new whatever. Something new must be better, right? The temptation is to always go after something novel, what some new writer puts out, what new idea is proclaimed. But Paul reminds Timothy, and he reminds us, hang on to the truth. Hold on to it. Don't look for something new. Remember and ground yourself in what you already have. Paul is telling him here to be immersed and wholly devoted to the truth that is found in God's word. And he gives him four reasons throughout this passage for why he should hold on to the truth. And the first one at the end of verse 14 is, you know those who taught you. Paul points out and reminds Timothy of the character of the people that had taught him. 
This would have been his mother and his grandmother, Lois and Eunice, and Paul himself, who trained Timothy up in the gospel. Paul says, Timothy, you can hold on to what is true and continue on in what you've learned and firmly believed because you've seen our example. You've seen how the gospel has worked in our lives and how we have endured, how we have held on. Look at the fruit of our life. And because of that, trust what has been given to you. Remain in the truth. Hold on to it. If you've been walking with the Lord, you know those people in your life. The ones that have invested in you, that have poured the gospel into you, told you the truth, taught you how to read the scriptures, modeled for you what it looked like to follow after God. Think about that person. Maybe it was your mom, your dad, your grandparents, your youth pastor, your life group leader. Whoever it is that God put in your life, you can look back to their example and what God did in and through them. And no, I can hold on to this. I can build my life on this because I've seen what God did in them. Sometimes our mentors and our examples fail us. People aren't infallible, right? But even if our mentors that pointed out to the truth to us fell away, we can look that as an example of how we can endure and how we can continue to pursue faithfully what God has given to us in his word. So Timothy, hold on to the truth. Church, hold on to the truth because you know the character of the people who taught you. Secondly, Paul says in verse 15, and you know that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. So Timothy is being reminded here that he has been taught by these examples from the earliest points of his life, the scriptures, the holy word of God. Lois and Eunice would have poured this into him at an early age. We know Timothy grew up in a Jewish home and he would have been, he would have learned the Old Testament law and prophets and the writings from the earliest age. So he had been trained up in this. He knew these holy sacred words. And Paul throwing in the word sacred or holy maybe in your translation isn't just a one-off extra word. It's a reminder here that these scriptures are from God. The holy scriptures that you learn from the first day of your life onward are from God himself. And not only are they from God, they are able to make you wise for salvation through Jesus Christ. Timothy's study of God's word prepared him to hear the gospel message of Jesus and respond to it. It prepared him to know that a Messiah would come and rescue God's people. And his heart was longing for the message of the gospel that came, so it made him wise and prepared him to respond. That's why we teach our kids in preschool and children and students the gospel project. Week in and week out, they are reminded of how all of God's word points to Christ, how he is the hero of the story. Because we want our littlest ones all the way up through to know that Jesus is the answer to what scripture is pointing to. All things point to him, all things flow from him. This makes them wise unto salvation as it did for Timothy. So you can hold on to the truth. You can trust it because God has given you the scriptures that have prepared you to hear and respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul builds on that logic with some of the most important words in scripture, his third reason in the beginning of verse 16, when he says, all scripture is inspired by God. And we're going to camp out here for a few minutes because I think that this is so important for us to grasp and to remember. All scripture is inspired by God. Now, when you hear the word inspiration, I don't know if you're like me, but when I hear inspiration, I think of art. I am not an artist. I am not creative in the least bit. If you ask people that know me, they will testify to that. So I hear the word inspiration and I think of an artist who, I don't know, sees a bird outside and then sits down and paints that bird because they've been inspired by it. That's my example because when you experience something or when you're inspired in traditional sense of the word, we think of something that's happened to us that then leads us to respond in a certain way to act. That's not what the scripture is talking about here. This word inspiration from the Greek comes from the word theonoustos, which literally means God breathed. Your translation may even say that, so that when you come to the scriptures, they aren't just a creation, something that just came from man's artistic inspiration or an experience. They come from God himself who have breathed them out. 
2 Peter 1.20 explains this process. Peter writes about how the Holy Spirit carried along the prophets, the one who wrote down the scriptures, carried them along so that when we get the message, when we get the scriptures, it has been protected and ensured that it is a true authoritative message from God because his spirit superintended all of it. It's not something that was just a creation of man. Now, God didn't like zap the prophets or the writers and make them go like, like this, like, okay, I'm writing this word because my arm's not really in my control. That's not what happened. He didn't inspire them through a sunset and then they wrote it down. But no, the Spirit carried them along. So when we come to God's word, when we come to the truth of the scriptures, we can rely on it. We can build our lives on it. We can sit underneath its authority because it is God breathed. You are not going to be disciplined in reading it unless you trust its authority over your life. And you can, because it is God breathed. This is such a difficult thing for us in our culture. We are so far removed to when these letters and these books were written. And so a lot of times people say, how can you trust in this book? It's so old, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't square with what I think or what I think I know or my feelings. And you're bombarded with that day in and day out. I mean, I remember when I was in sixth grade, I was still in elementary school, and we did this um, play on peer mediation. This was my only theatrical performance in my life. Uh, it was a peer mediation play, and I was the bully. My name was Squeaky. If you want tape, my mom's probably got it. It's probably laugh worthy. But anyways, when we went through that play, the only thing I remember is that we'd come to the end of it, and we all stood up at the end, and we held hands, and we repeated like five times, if it's to be, it's up to me. If it's to be, it's up to me. And I remember as a 12-year-old being like, what does that mean? Like, this doesn't make any sense. And still to this day, I don't know what it means. Like, you have some power within you to create something, or maybe because of your feelings or what you know, you have some authority? No. We do not sit above the word of God. We do not have authority over it through our reason or our feelings. We sit underneath the authority of God because the scriptures that he's given to us are from him and we can trust them. Remember back to the garden of Eden when Eve is being tempted by the serpent. What is the first and primary way that he gets her in temptation to go and to eat the apple? The first thing he does is he gets her to doubt what God has said. Did God really say? By the end of his temptation, he outrise, outrightly denies God's authority and truth. So Satan is always trying to get you and me to believe that we have some authority or some truth over the Bible. But no, we need to sit under the scriptures there from God. When you hear that whisper in your heart or in your mind that this isn't really true, that comes from the enemy. You can trust this word. You can build your life upon it. It is able to make you wise unto salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So Paul tells Timothy, you can hold on to the truth because you know your teachers. You know this sacred scripture that you've been taught and you know that it is from God himself. He has breathed it out. And then lastly, he tells Timothy that this scripture, you can hold on to the truth because this scripture is able to fully equip believers. Go back to the text and the rest of 16 and 17. He says, all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So the scripture that is from God that we sit underneath is profitable for us because it teaches us and it rebukes us. It shapes what we believe. The word rebuke here is truly to get us on the, the right path, to turn away from our sin ourselves. We're rebuked by the scriptures to follow after God. So when Paul writes here, our teaching and rebuking, that is about our doctrine and what we believe. The scriptures are profitable to shape that. What we worship and what we say comes from God's word. It shapes that. But it also shapes our conduct. The correcting and the training for righteousness. Correcting here means restoring putting you back in the right place to where you need to be to follow after Christ so that you're being trained up in righteousness, becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. Remember, read your Bible, 
pray every day and you'll grow, grow, grow. You want to be equipped and trained up in this righteousness, go back to the word. Read God's word. Remember what he has taught us through it. We see here that it says that so that the man of God may be completely equipped for every good work. If you want to follow after and grow in Christ, you go to his word, you read it, you obey it, and you follow after the example that he's given through the scriptures. Jesus himself, when he prayed for the believers that would come after him, said, I pray to Lord that you would sanctify them by your truth and your word is the truth. So when we think about how do we hold on to the truth, we go back to remembering what Jesus says about the word of God. We can grow in this word, we can trust in this word because Jesus himself prayed that we would grow up in it to become more like him. And again, if you ever feel the weight of the temptation to doubt this truth, to doubt God's word, go back to Christ. Look at his example of how he sat under God's word. I told you one example just then of how he prayed for us to be sanctified in it. But go back to the beginning before his ministry. Do you remember what happened when he was tempted in the wilderness? How did Jesus respond to Satan's temptations? How did he respond to Satan at every turn? When Satan said to him, hey, turn these stones into bread, did Jesus respond and say, you know, I just don't think, or I really don't feel like a good God would make me choose between this. No, he didn't say that. He responded with God's word. He responded with the book of Deuteronomy. He responded with the truth of scripture. And when he said that he would not come and get rid of any of the law, that no smallest letter would be taken away, but that it would all last until it was fulfilled. These are the things that Jesus said. He said in John 10, 35, that the scriptures would not and cannot be broken when he responded to his critics. Why could they not be broken? Because they came from God himself. So as you're holding on to this word, as you are trusting in this truth and following after it to become what God has created you to be, realize that you're in good company following after your savior, Jesus Christ. So for you and me, how how do we do this? How do we practically hold on to the truth? Well, once we believe in its authority, once we trust that it is God's word to us by his grace given to us, we need to commit to reading it. So a few practical takeaways for us today. The first thing that we do, how do we hold on to the truth? Commit to reading God's word. We can all say that we don't have enough time to read the Bible. We're all busy. Culture tells us we're busy. We make ourselves busy. And we can all say that we're too busy for it. But in reality, when we set aside God's word, we have to wonder if we don't read it because we don't trust it. So when we commit to reading God's word, we make some specific plans that we follow after. So for me, we pick a time and pick a place. Jay's talked about this a lot. For me, every morning, I get up really early. I am not an early riser Getting up early is really difficult for me, but I know I have to do it because if I wait till my kids get up, it's gonna be chaos. No offense, Wyatt, sorry. Uh, But yes, I wake up early, 545, and I sit in this wicker chair that's in our living room. And I sit there because it's not really a comfortable chair. So I'm able to focus better and I don't get sleepy and fall back asleep because I'm sitting in that chair. And I'm reading, I'm picking a plan, I'm reading the day-by-day chronological study Bible. George Guthrie organized it. He introduces some chapters with different things to prepare you to read. So I've picked a plan. And sometimes people are reticent to do that because they're like, "Ah, I don't wanna be just a checkbox reader of the Bible. Well, here's the thing. I would rather you be a checkmark reader of the Bible than not a reader of the Bible at all. For me, finding a plan, even though sometimes you do battle that temptation against just completing a task, is something that you get into your life and is much better than just doing the old. So have some intentionality in what you're doing. Commit to reading the word. Pick a time, pick a place, pick a plan. And then find community and accountability. This is where sometimes I think we go wrong in our talks about spiritual disciplines. Yes, they are us and God and they begin that way, but they don't end that way because the Christian walk was never meant to be done in isolation. 
You need to be in community with other believers discussing what God is teaching you in and through his word. You need to be sharpened by other believers that can push back or challenge you or encourage you, encouraging you in what you're learning. So find some accountability as you're doing this, as you're growing up in God's word. And here's a couple of resources for you that some of them will have available after the service that can help you as you start this. One of the things is maybe you're a new believer. Maybe uh, you have not been walking with the Lord for long or you haven't started reading the Bible regularly. We have a book out there that you can take free of charge called How to Read the Bible for the First Time. It's by Diane Werner, one of our members here. And this book truly introduces you for the first time to how to read the scriptures. She wrote this for women who are in prison, and so it is very basic. So if you are intimidated by the word or you know somebody who is, start here. I promise you, this is worth your read if you feel intimidated by the scriptures. If you need a basic plan, we have spec cards out there. And those cards give you an outline for how you can study the word, just simple things that you can pay attention to. But on the back of the card, there's a very basic reading plan for how you can read through the Bible in a year. So if you need a plan that simple, just go pick up one of those cards afterwards. Or go to YouVersion. It's a Bible app. You can get it on your phone. It's online as well. They have thousands of Bible reading plans. Find the one that's right for you. You can even set it to remind you every morning to be in the Word. It's helpful. And then go pick up a Summer Connect brochure and find that group that can give you accountability and point you back to the truth. Simple things as you commit to read the Bible. Then two more things that you can do when you sit down to read. When you come and you sit down and you have your Bible open, the first thing I want you to do is pray. Why do I want you to do that? Because sometimes we coldly go to God's word and we treat it just like another book. But if we believe that this word is from God and that it's living and active, we need to ask him humbly to open our eyes to the truth. Just a simple prayer as you come to the word. Lord, open my eyes so that I may see your truth this morning. May I see what you've revealed in your word. Prepare your heart in that way. And then the last thing, very simple. When you finish your time reading the word, pray. Ask God to help you to remember what you've read. You and I know that feeling. You've read something in the morning and you go throughout your day and you're like, what did I even read? Ask God to bring it to your mind and to your heart. Ask him to help you by his spirit to live it out and to really apply it and to follow after it. Simple ways that we can continue on and to hold on to the truth and grow in our faith. So as we do this and as we follow after Christ, we do realize, and I do realize, that you cannot continue on in what you have learned or firmly believed if you've never believed it in the first place. So if you're a believer here today, I hope that you've been encouraged and reminded of why you can trust and sit under the authority of God's word. But I know that there are people who are here today that have not believed in Christ for the first time. And we believe and we proclaim week in and week out that these scriptures that we teach you from are truly able to make you wise unto salvation in Christ. And we believe and we proclaim that God created a perfect world. The scriptures testify to it. He created all things beautiful and perfect. But the scriptures tell us that because of our sin and our rebellion against God, we are separated from him. Brokenness enters our world. That's why things are the way they are. That's why we are, as the Bible says, enemies of God, separated from him. But the scriptures also testify to the truth that God didn't leave us in that state. He came to us in the person of Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. And Jesus lived a perfect life according to this word, a sinless life. And he went to the cross in our place. He did not deserve the punishment of the cross, but he went and he bore it willingly to set us free from our sins. And then through his resurrection, he triumphed over sin and death and hell so that for all of us who put our faith in Jesus Christ, we can know that we will not face the judgment and that we will be with God for eternity. So if you are here today and you have never learned or believed that for the first time, I hope that you will see that there is a God that has come to you and made a way for you to have a relationship with him. And we wanna help you to grow up in that faith so that you can see all that God has created you for. 
So brothers and sisters, we come to this time and we're reminded of the truth of God's word and we're all faced with the reality of do we trust it? Do we sit under its authority? Will we follow it? And that also leads us to this time where we prepare to take the Lord's Supper. We proclaim this gospel. We tell you about how God came to you. And we remember all that Jesus did for us as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. So in just a couple moments, our deacons are gonna come forward and they're gonna pass out the plates and they're going to give you two cups. One will have a piece of bread at the bottom and one will have juice. And if you're a believer, if you're a follower of Christ, this table is open to you. We want you to take and to remember what Christ has done on the cross. But if you aren't a follower of Christ, if you haven't put your faith in him, we'd ask that you just quietly pass the plate and use this time to reflect on what it means to have a relationship with God. But let's take a few moments now to prepare our hearts to receive the Lord's Supper. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you that we can trust it. We thank you that we can live in light of it. And Father, most of all, we thank you for the message of the gospel that it teaches us of how we can be reconciled to you through Jesus Christ. Lord, as we prepare our hearts to take of what represents your body and your blood, help us to remember the sacrifice. Help us to be humbled by it so that we would live in light of it. And Lord, for those who are here today that have not put their trust in you, would you open their eyes through the simple act of remembrance to the grace that you showed us through the shedding of your blood and the breaking of your body. It's in Christ's name I pray, amen.
as Jesus gathered with his disciples at the last Passover meal, he took the bread and the cup and he said to them, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. And after the bread, he took of the cup and he reminded them that this was the blood of the new covenant that would be shed for the forgiveness of sins. So do this in remembrance of him. Brothers and sisters, this represents the blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the table, how it humbles us and reminds us of our need for you. And Father, how you met that need through the breaking of your body and the shedding of your blood. Father, again, I pray today that by your spirit, you would open the eyes of those that do not know you, that have not put their trust in you. Break down the walls in their heart and in their mind and help them to see the goodness of who you are. Lord, we love you and we thank you for Christ. It's in his name we pray, amen. Again, you have the choice today. Will you sit under the authority of what God has revealed to us in his word? If you've heard the gospel message today and the spirit is working within you and you would like to talk more about what it means to follow after Christ, I'll be out in the atrium in just a minute to the right at our next steps area. I would love to talk with you. We've got other decision counselors who would be there that would love to pray with you, talk with you more about what it means to put your faith in Christ. Or if you need to talk about reading the Bible and need some resources, we've got some available there. However the Lord is working on in you today, we pray that His Spirit would lead you to respond. Stand now as we respond in song. Join us in singing this great hymn of our faith. How firm a foundation ye say. to Brian for bringing such a great word uh, today and it's great to know the foundation of that we are built on is the rock the solid rock of Jesus Christ and the word that he's given us so he told you how to respond if you need to do that do that this morning and also don't forget you are loved and you are sent have a great Sunday <laughs>